and share my screen. Abby, please mute yourself. I think you can mute her too. Is your vibe on her questions? Okay. I muted Abby. Okay. <laughs> you can chat if you want to say anything in the chat. Okay. Here we go. Oh, before I uh, share my screen. Um, oh, wait a sec. Okay, before I share my screen, so I just want to remind everybody about next week. So there won't be a lab. We will not have a lab uh, on Monday. On Wednesday, instead of a lab, I'm asking everybody to go to the lab uh, in ABLMS, and we're going to meet for a review session for the final. So uh, during that review session, I'm going to go over questions, a set of questions. I'll open them up on Canvas. You'll find them in the final week uh, place on, mod on their modules. So these questions, we're gonna go over them together. If you get a chance to look through them before you come on Wednesday, that would be great. And I can guarantee you some of these questions will be in one form or another in the final. So coming to that review session is important. I won't be giving out the key. I want it to be a discussion. I want you to be there to take notes. That's one way of studying for the final. Uh, it's not a lab review, it's a whole course review. So we're not gonna review only lab information. We're going to review everything and solve questions together some of these questions will come on the final. And I want you to be there in person to take notes and benefit from that. It's kind of like studying for the final. If you're listening, taking notes, it's not gonna be something that I will circulate written. Um, that doesn't help you as much as being there, asking questions, uh, taking notes. And I can go over certain, any questions you might have. We can go over theories together, concepts, lab questions, anything that you have during that review session. So come to lab at 9.30 um, and we will spend um, some time, um, not necessarily the entire period, but yeah, until we've got, we go over all the questions, okay? So I hope that you all come. It'll be very, very, very beneficial. Otherwise, you're gonna miss out. There will be no recording and there will be no key given out. So I would like you to be there. Okay. Um, all right. So now I can share my screen. I kind of forgot how I do this. Um, I lectured all online uh, last semester. Okay. Here we go. Can you see my screen? Yep. Good. Uh, like I said, um, you can unmute yourself if you want to answer a question. Keep your video on so that we see you engaged like you are in a classroom. Um, and I'm widening here the view of all of you so I can see you on my screen as I'm presenting as well. Okay, um, I might not be able to see the chat. Nigel will look at that and help me. Let me know if there's a question or anything. Okay, so mineral analysis. Um, I expect that you all uh, watched the enzyme lecture. It's an important lecture that will be part of the final material. If you have not done that, it was supposed to be last Wednesday. I urge you to do that uh, before next week. Um, and if and you let me know if you have questions. Okay, mineral analysis. Why is it important to analyze minerals? All right, I see there are some chat going on. Okay, let me put it here in front of me. Nutrition label. Yes, Sandy, that is correct. What else? What's on the nutrition label? Do you remember the minerals on the nutrition label? 
you can list them, tell me, unmute yourself. Potassium. Cal calcium, yes. What else? Sodium. Sodium, thank you. What else? Potassium. Potassium, that's one of the new ones. Very good, that's for the new label. And there's one more. Vitamin D. That's vitamin, but in oh. terms of mineral. Iron. Iron, yes, it, it's important mineral. So calcium and iron uh, were always there. And then they added potassium. And of course, sodium was or, always there. Okay, so that's nutrition label. What else? Uh, if you got claims, you could, you probably should do an analysis if you have, if you have like a claim for high iron or potassium. Okay, yeah, definitely. You want to do it to put it on the label and you want to make sure that you can, uh, your claim is correct. Now, um, and other than that, you have processing. For example, if you think about um, when you take wheat, and you remove the bran, you're removing quite a bit of the, of the iron. So it is, um, you have to put back iron to the content that it was before the, the whole wheat was, the bran was removed. So this, we call it enrichment, to bring back the minerals to the same level that they were at before you did any processing, removing of uh, the bran. For example, another thing is important is uh, water quality. So when we process using water, water hardness is really important because um, during, uh, you know, if you're doing, let's say, um, beverage formulation, and if you use water that is high in calcium, this is going to cause cloudiness of your beverage. If you also use water that is high in minerals, and let's say you're trying to do pickles, then you're going to get wilting of your um, vegetable because water is going to go out of the vegetable into a place that outside where you have high mineral content. So during processing, it's really important to utilize water that is not hard water. So you oftentimes, as a quality measure of water, you do hardness. Not only microbes, hardness of water is important. The mineral content of water is important. Fortification. So if you're fortifying, so if you want to add, let's say in an orange juice, you add calcium to orange juice. So you are fortifying. You're adding an important mineral to a juice. So you wanna make sure that what you're claiming as calcium present, it should be at 100% or higher of your claim. That is something that you want to remember as well is your nutritional uh, labeling and the claims that you make. So if it is endogenous, it's okay to be 80% or higher of what you claim. But if it is fortified, if you fortify with a mineral, it's really important to be at 100% or higher. So these are the reasons um, that we talked about nutrition labeling, fortification versus naturally present. So enrichment, that's basically you're bringing it back to where it was before processing. Fortification, you're adding your minerals uh, so that you can make a claim. Um, maybe if you're adding fluoride, for example, you make a claim. It's not it's not something that is present uh, on the label. You don't put fluoride on your nutrition label. Uh, you can, the extended form of the nutrition label, if you're making a, a, a claim of iodine or fluoride, then um, basically you have to make sure that you analyze and you uh, have the amount that you are claiming. Um, so these are the... the now we have sodium, we have potassium added, we have the iron and calcium. So the old one uh, only had so sodium, calcium, and iron. So potassium was added to the new nutritional fact panel. So minerals are important. They're essential minerals that we have to consume to meet the body requirement. You hear the term macro 
elements. So these are that are needed by our body at over 100 milligrams per day. So that these are called macros. So the calcium, the phosphorus, sodium, potassium, magnesium, chloride, and sulfur. Trace elements, they're very important as well to us, but they are um, in needed in milligrams or micrograms. So that's why they're called trace elements. So this is iron, zinc, copper, and iodine. Toxic elements, so we wanna make sure we don't have toxicity um, or toxic elements. So we also test for lead, mercury, cadmium, and aluminum. Arsenic, for example, is uh, needed for a, a certain amount, but at high amount, then they become uh, toxic. Um, same with fluoride or iodine. You have to make sure that you don't overconsume certain minerals. So now to the bottom line of, of analysis. If you have questions, by the way, you can put them in the chat as well as I go. So mineral analysis, we learned about it when we, we uh, did the atomic absorption, atomic emission uh, spectroscopy, where you take your food sample, you ash, you get your ash, and then you determine a whole panel of, of mineral elements in your samples. Usually when you have a lot of samples and a lot of minerals, you are uh, looking to uh, detect and quantitate, use atomic absorption or ICP, inductively coupled plasma atomic emission spectroscopy. So these are really common for when you have a lot of samples, a lot of minerals. But sometimes you're just looking at hardness of water, uh, amount of calcium or magnesium in water. Sometimes you're looking at just salt, how much salt you have. So you can do titration, uh, sometimes you're just looking at phosphorus content. You can do colorimetric assay. And also you can do ion selective ele uh, electrodes. So it's like a pH meter, but instead of an electrode for hydrogen, you have an electrode for the ion of interest. Um, so today we are going to talk about mostly titration, colorimetric assay, and ISE, because we already talked about talked about atomic absorption. So for um, consideration, when we're looking at uh, analysis for minerals, sometimes we have to ash, sometimes we don't have to ash. So if we're doing EDTA um, titration for water hardness, obviously you don't ash. So for salt, using more titration, we don't need to ash. But obviously, when we want to do atomic absorption or ICP or colorimetric assay, we want to remove the organic matter. And also when we're doing uh, electrode, the ion selective electrode, we need to ash so that we remove interferences as much as possible, organic matter, and we'll have only your minerals. So what are some considerations during sample preparation? What do we wanna avoid or account for? Can you think of anything when you're preparing your sample? What do you want to avoid? We don't want volatiles or potentially like iron to evaporate off. Yes, it is a good consideration. We don't wanna lose by volatility, yes. But another thing that actually I have here, but your point page is correct. What do we not want? Maybe, maybe avoiding the contamination. Yes, avoiding contamination. So yes. So whatever you do, you wanna avoid contamination. Sometimes when you're milling your sample, if you're looking for iron, if you put it in a metallic uh, grinder, you might have metals. Uh, that can contaminate your sample, or sometimes the reagents that you use or the glassware that you use that might get uh, some contamination of minerals. So first, you wash your glassware with dilute acid to remove any contamination. But if you want to avoid contamination from reagents that you're using, you have to run a blank. Okay, 
So interference, so sometimes changes in pH might impact the reaction, temperature might impact the reaction, whatever other constituents in your sample will impact whether it's a titration or a spectrophotometric re uh, reaction and the reagents that you're using as well. So to avoid that or to account for that, we prepare the standards the same way we prepare our samples, basically. So the first method I'm gonna talk about is the EDTA complexometric titration. And this is for measuring hardness of water and the content of calcium or magnesium. So EDTA is a compound that uh, can form a stable complex with these ions, the calcium ion and the magnesium ion. So there is negative groups in EDTA that will react uh, with the, the divalent uh, ions. They have two positive ions and form complexes that are stable. So what we do is that if you have the, the water, we add an indicator. We add what a Kalnagite indicator, and that indicator also binds to the calcium or magnesium ion that you have, but forms a weak bond with them. And when it binds, that indicator goes from blue to pink. So if you bring water, you add your indicator, and if you have calcium or magnesium in there, the color is gonna go from blue to pink. And then you titrate with EDTA. So before we do the titration, however, we wanna make sure that the pH is high. If, if the pH is low, EDTA get protonated. So if the EDTA capture protons, hydrogen plus, what happens is it doesn't have binding sites anymore for the calcium and the magnesium. So we wanna ensure that um, the EDTA carries a negative charge. So we make sure that the pH is, is really high. Uh, so we do the titration at pH 10 uh, or 11. And when you titrate, what happens is the, as you titrate with EDTA, so you have in your burette your EDTA, and then you have your water that is now pink because of the indicator that, bond, that binds calcium and magnesium. So what happens is uh, as you titrate with EDTA, EDTA is going to replace the indicator because it binds strongly and form a more stable complex with the calcium and magnesium. So the calcium and magnesium, instead of reacting with the indicator, they will in interact with EDTA. And the, as the indicator, as you titrate more, this indicator will start will giving up the calcium and mag or magnesium, and the color changes to blue. When the color goes back to blue, that means all of the calcium and magnesium that were bound to the indicator is now bound to EDTA. The reaction uh, is complete, and then you can do the back calculation to determine amount of calcium and magnesium. Now, if you wanna do a quick qualitative check, so there are test strips. The test strips are impregnated with all of your uh, reagents that you need. And when you dip it in water, you get that replacement and movement and changes in color happens basically. And based on the change in color, you can get an indication of how much of the water ha hardness. So there would be a scale. So it's based on the same principle, same reagents, but it's a very quick quality check. They call it aqua check test strips for testing aqua water, which is the uh, hardness of water. So also titration is used to determine salt content. And that is very easy. So you have your um, NaCl. So the chloride here is the one that we um, react with silver nitrate. So you have your silver uh, ion plus, and then your chloride ion will form silver chloride. 
a new titrate until all chloride has complexed with the silver. You have an indicator, which is chromate indicator. The next drop of silver nitrate, when all the chloride has reacted, the next drop will make the, not, the silver react with the chromate and give you an orange precipitate. That's the end point of your reaction. Again, you use the equilibrium reaction to determine uh, the amount of um, uh, silver nitrate that reacted with the chloride to determine the chloride concentration by, by taking into account the volume and the molarity of silver nitrate. Okay, now this reaction is also a titration reaction and we call it backward titration. So this is a forward titration and the reason it's called forward titration because it's one step. So it's basically you titrating with a uh, silver nitrate. So you have your sample that has the salt and the, in the burette you have silver nitrate and it's a direct forward reaction. So you titrate until all of the chloride is reacted. So they call that forward reaction. The volar titration is also for salt, but it's backward titration. Now, why do they do that when they have a simple assay? I'm not sure, but I have been developed earlier than the other. But the way it works is that here, instead of titrating with silver nitrate, you titrate with thiocyanate. So what you do here is you have your sample and you, you add a known amount in excess of silver nitrate. So you have your sample and you dump in silver nitrate, a known amount, a known volume of a known molarity, and it's in excess. So all of your chloride present is gonna react and then there will be remaining silver nitrate in the, in the flask. The remaining silver nitrate in the flask that did not react with the salt because already salt reacted will be titrated with thiocyanate. So what happens here, you know the amount that you have originally of the silver nitrate, and then you, you measure the volume it took to reach equilibrium. And then the way you find out the equilibrium is by using iron or ferric ion uh, as an indicator. Excess uh, thiocyanate will react with the indicator to give you a red color, and this is the end of the titration. So, so basically here, um, in this case, we know the amount that we added to our sample. We determine how much reacted with sodium thionate or thiocyanate. And what happens is you take the difference. So you know how much reacted by getting the volume of the thiocyanate, and then you know how much you've had originally. The difference would be how much silver reacted with chloride, and it's one-to-one -one ratio. If you know how much silver reacted with chloride, you know how much chloride you had. So that's why it's called backward titration. It's more involved. Um, but at the end of the day, you're able to determine your salt content. So also there are qualitative methods based on more titration. So again, it is a test strip impregnated with the reagent, the uh, sodium nitrate and the indicator. And here it's dipped in the sample where you have the chloride or sodium chloride and a change in color um, happened that is very rapid. And you can just, you get a scale of color change and you can detect um, semi-quantitatively the amount of salt. It is an approved method of analysis. Chlorometric methods. So um, in the chlorometric method, what you have here is you add the substance that it is a chromogen, so it carries a color. 
and it will react with the mineral to, to get the compound that you measure absorption of. So a very famous example, and it's still used, is you measure the amount of phosphorus. So, but ashing is required because you want to release phosphorus from its uh, interaction with organic compounds. So you ash and then you solubilize the mineral and, and then you have phosphorus in solution. Then you react it with molybdovenidate reagent. So phosphorus reacting with molybdovenidate gives you a very characteristic yellow color. So of course you have to run standards of phosphorus, different concentrations, and you follow Beer's law and you can get um, concentration based on the calibration curve that you have with the standards. Last one here is the ion selective electrode. And in this case, it's commonly used for calcium, sodium, chloride, uh, potassium, and fluoride. Um, so the way it works similar as a pH meter, but instead of having a pH electrode for measuring uh, protons or hydrogen ions, you're having an electrode that is sensitive to either of these elements. Um, and it's the same thing. So you have to have you have to ash your samples so your minerals are in solution. You have to have standards so you prepare standards at different concentrations, and then you put the electrodes in your in each of the standards and get a reading and also uh, of your sample and then you plot it to plot the calibration curve and you get the concentration. Uh, the change in current is again reflects the concentration is correlated with the concentration of these uh, different uh, ions. Um, so there are several considerations though with using the ISE. Um, it is um, sensitive to the ionic activity. So the total ions you have and not necessarily just the ions of interest. So we have to run the samples and the standards at the same ionic activity or ionic concentration. Uh, sometimes you have an electrode that is sensitive for one uh, ion, but it can also uh, detect interfering ions. So you have about 10% error uh, embedded in your reading. However, it's very sensitive. It can go down to 10 to the negative six smaller. However, at very low concentrations, like with the pH meter, you have to wait until you, you get a reliable reading. So you need to wait until the reading stabilizes um, and then take the reading. So its applications, we can measure salt and nitrate in processed meat, calcium in milk, salt in butter and cheese, potassium and sodium levels in wine. So that's where it's most common uh, application for ISE. Now I want you to pull a piece of paper and this is for a plus two. You can bring it, give it to me on Monday um, in class. So here, there are a few things going on. This is the Vollard reaction, titration. This is the backward titration. So I remind you here of the um, chemical reactions happening. And you have 25 grams of samples that was dried, then ashed, and finally analyzed for salt content by Vollard titration method. So I'm giving you the weight of the sample as five grams um, of the dried sample. So you started with 25, you ended up with five, and this sample was ashed, and the ashed sample weight was one gram. So one gram out of five gram was ash. Then the ash was solubilized and 30 milliliter of uh, silver nitrate was added, 0.1 molar to the ash sample. And then we added the ferric ammonium sulfate as uh, a source of ferric ion as an indicator. And then we titrated 
with potassium thiocyanate. And we give you the volume of the titration. Here we have the molarity. Uh, one thing you need to know is the molecular weight of salt, sodium chloride, is 58.5. I don't have it here, so write it down. You will need it in the final calculation. So what you want to do is get the moisture content, the ash content on dry bases, and then the salt content in the original 25 grams of sample as expressed weight by weight. So think it through. And when you have an answer for each one of those, uh, just um, let us know. I'll give you a few minutes to work on it. And you can start putting in the chat box your answer when you start having answers. Anybody got the moisture content? I put 80% in the group chat. Oh, you did. OK, sorry, I didn't see. Uh, yes. Perfect. 80% moisture, 20% ash on dry bases. That is correct. Great. So everybody got that? Any questions on how we got? The 80 or the 20 that you would like me to go over? Anybody would like me to go over the 80% or the 20% calculation? If not, move on to the next one. You got to think about it. I'm going to give you a few hints. I need all of you to work on this. Um, so first of all, I want to remind you that you add a known amount of silver nitrate to your sample. So we added 30 milliliter of 0.1 molar silver nitrate. So you have the volume, you have the molarity. You can get number of moles. So how, what is, how do you get number of moles? Can someone tell me how we get number of moles? Given mass over molecular mass. Say that again. The given mass over molecular mass. The, yes, but here you have volume and you have molarity. How can you use the volume and molarity to get number of moles? What the equation is? You can do concentration times volume. Say that again, Sri. Uh, concentration times volume or the molarity times volume in this case? Yes, the molarity times volume because molarity equals number of moles by volume. So if you have 30 ml and you have the molarity, but you wanna make sure the 30 ml is converted to liters. So it is 0 0.03. 
you want to make sure that you have that in liters. So you get the number of moles of the silver nitrate that you have added. And then you get the number of moles of silver nitrates that reacted with potassium thiocyanate. How you get that, again, you get the volume and you have the molarity, you get the number of moles. And the equation is one mole to one mole. So the number of moles here would be equal to the number of moles of the silver nitrate that reacted. So you get number of moles here and number of moles there at the beginning. The difference would be the number of moles that reacted with the chloride. With this information, do the calculation and tell me, and let me know when you have an answer for C. Do you, do you have an answer? I don't see all of you calculating. I gave you the hint, so I need to, you to make sure that you're working on it. Abby, what is this that you gave me right now? What What is that number that you've given me? The, the change in volume, the iron moles, I mean. Um, the change in moles. You have, um, you have some error there. Um, how did you get? 0 0.00297. Uh, I took the difference between uh, 30 mil and 1, 0.1 molarity and uh, 3 mil and 0.1 molarity. So the, what was the number of moles of the 30 mil of 0.1 molar? 0 0.003. 0 0.003, correct. What's yeah. the number of moles of 3 ml of 0.1 molar? 0 0.003. Okay, so the difference of that is not the number you gave me. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. So the difference is what? So the point sixty three. It should be point zero zero two seven. Yes, that's number of moles. Now convert that to percentage, the question is express as weight by weight, the salt content. And I gave you the molecular weight of sodium chloride as 58.5. Tyler got the correct answer. Oh yeah. So Nigel, yes. Uh, Nigel asked me to, sh to have you show me your lab notebooks on Monday for those of you that didn't have complete information. So you can show me on Monday. Um, yeah, I will have a final look anyway on Wednesday for all lab notebook to give you the final grade. Okay, so. Uh, Abby, did you get to uh, finish your calculations from 0 0.027? Yeah, what with the molecular weight? I missed it somewhere. I'm just seeing that. Yeah, so when you have the molecular weight, then you follow the equation of 
number of moles equals mass of a molecular weight. So you got the number of moles of 0 0.0027. That's the difference. And since mm -hmm. it's one to one mole reaction, so the 0 0.027 basically is the number of mole here when you have, um, whoops. So have I would multiply one mole. Molecular weight. Yes, so the number of yeah. moles of silver equal the number of moles of chloride at equilibrium. So uh, you multiply by the molecular weight of sodium chloride because that's the salt, that's what react with silver nitrate and you get 0.158 grams. Sure. And 0.158 grams out of 25 grams, because that's you want to get the percentage weight by weight. So 0 0.158 by 25 grams times 100 gives you the 0.632% or 0.63% that Tyler got. Um, yeah. Tyler, was that how you got it? Tyler, where are you? Yep, that's how I got it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Question. I got as far as the 0.15795, but how did you get to weight by weight percent? Oh. Yes. So I'm showing you here. So after you get the moles and number of moles weight over molecular weight, so the weight is the number of moles times the molecular weight, you get the 0.158. And then because the question is weight by weight, salt to the amount of sample, so 0.158 divided by the original weight of sample times 100, you get the percentage weight by weight. Any questions on how we got there? So, uh, clear. yeah, so in, in an exam, I would tell you how I give you the exact same information. And then you would know that we added silver nitrate to your sodium chloride, they reacted. And then the whatever is remaining will react when you titrate with potassium thiocyanate, it would uh, react and then you get the amount that was re reacting. And then the difference would be the amount that actually reacted with chloride. So, and that's what you want to remember is we're looking for the difference. The difference would be how much they reacted with the salt. And because it's one to one molar ratio in the equation, then whatever mole of us, silver nitrate reacting with sodium chloride will be equivalent to the number of moles of sodium chloride present. I will give you the molecular weight of sodium chloride. You would get the weight, you have the weight of the original sample, and then you get the percentage salt. Okay, any questions there? All right. So um, we have five minutes, but I'm not going to start a new topic. So I'm a little bit uh, behind. Um, but the last lecture on extraneous matter is, can be done in 10, 15 minutes. So what I'll be doing is on Monday, I'll do the immunoassays. On Wednesday, during the lecture, I will finish contaminants of concern. And during the review session, the first 10, 15 minutes, I'll just cover the extraneous matter, which is very easy lecture, very straightforward, um, and it's very, very short. So I'll cover that and then we'll do the review session. Um, so again, um, I hope that all of you show up to the review session so that you don't miss out. Any questions now before we end? I will post the recording of this lecture on, on Canvas as well. Any questions? I'm going to look at the chat. No questions.
Okay, you guys, enjoy your weekend. Stay warm, stay safe, and I'll see you on Monday. Thank bye you. Bye. bye. Thank you. Hey, Pam. Pam, I actually think I have a question. You do? You think? I think I have one. <laughs> okay. Um, could, is there any chance you could go over how we got the ash for this one too? Yes. The um, 20%? Yes, absolutely. So if you look, let me share the screen again. Okay. Okay. So what you see here is we ashed, this, we first dried the sample. So we ended up with five grams of dry matter, mm -hmm. right? And, and the question here is asking about ash on dry weight basis. So, and then I tell you here, I have one gram uh, of ash. So when you ash the sample, you weigh, then you got one gram of ash. Okay. And you have five grams of dry matter. So one oh. gram over five times 100 is 20%. Oh, okay. Okay, I see it, there we go. Yeah, and I then think I was using the, the wrong numbers. <laughs> and then you got the moisture content. Yeah, the moisture. I understood. Yeah. Okay. Well, right. see you later. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.